What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Indie Inkwell. My name is JJ. I am one of your two co-hosts. Unfortunately, the Air Force yet again has kept Longbox Entertainment away from us this week, but that is okay. The show will go on. We've got a very special guest with a super fun comic. I'm super excited to talk about this today. Please, everybody, welcome Mark Maya. Is that is that pronounced correctly? Yeah, yeah, you did it. You nailed it. Awesome. Mark I should have asked you that before we went on, but <laughs> no, it's been good. I, I, I was fairly confident. You know, about 15 years ago, um, everybody would get that wrong. I got may may I may I uh, is Mark may may I and right. So I've to- noticed people have gotten a lot better with like quote unquote like unusual spelled yeah. names lately. So. <laughs> And like uh, Maya has become a popular, like since then Maya has become a popular name with like teenage girls. Like there, there was a stint yeah. there that I leave the house without <laughs> tripping over one, and they're all spelled differently: M A Y A, M A J A, M A Y. Yeah, I've seen a whole bunch so of different many. ones. So we'd like to start off every show getting the guest's origin story. Every good comic book character has a great origin story. We figure comic book creators have good origin stories because everybody gets into this industry or this hobby very differently, I've noticed, especially doing these interviews. So what was kind of your entry into or your, I guess your rather first exposure to comic books and kind of what made you decide to go into that industry? Because I know originally you were in the gaming industry, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I still am. I'm, I just left the office environment, okay. and now I'm doing. Um, when my son was born, I left the office so I could be home, uh, and um, and now I'm doing contract work. So I'm still working in the video game industry just as a contractor. Gotcha. Just not fully employed with one particular place. That's exactly, that's yeah, probably yeah. the easier way to do it, anyway, right? It's 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 nice when there's. Uh, you know, well, I'm home, which it gets a little lonely, but it has its benefits. You know, I can right. take a shower in the middle of the day if I feel like <laughs> take a nap <laughs> in the middle of the day yeah. if you want. So, <laughs> hell, I got a, a nice little comfy couch right here. Heck yeah. Oh, yeah. But as I was going to say, because I, I had, I was going to, before you get into it, I'm going to fanboy out for a split second because I know you worked on one of my favorite games of all time growing up, and that was Destroy All Humans. <laughs> well, so, I worked on the mobile version, but yeah. Was it? It's the mobile version. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. okay. But still, hey, that is still one of my favorite games ever. So, <laughs> oh, I see uh, Peter. Uh, Peter, how's it going, buddy? I saw him come popping up in the chat there. Hey, what's going it's, on, Peter? But yeah, my, uh, so board game peeps <laughs> back on topic. Uh, <laughs> what, what was your exposure to comic books and what kind of decided made you decide to go into it uh, yourself? Well, there's, um, let's say the two part question there because mm-hmm. when I got into, um, comics was probably when i was around 13 and it was with uh so you guys can do the math and figure out my age I was 13 and it was spider-man number one torment the one drawn by todd mcfarland ah okay and uh and i saw it and i was like this is awesome right like it was art that i wasn't used to experiencing because like it was my first uh it was the comic book that pulled me in like I've tried comic books when I was younger, but I didn't know what to buy. And, mm-hmm. you know, my parents would buy whatever I pointed to. I was like, I pointed to a daredevil comic book when I was like, you know, 11 or 10 years old. And it was just way over my head. I didn't understand. Oh it. yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> it was too dark. So I was like, I, I try to like it, but I was like, eh, eh. So for me, I didn't like, really understand what was going on. When yeah. You're so then when I was 13, a comic book store opened up uh, near my house where it was like, I just had to cross the street to get to it, uh, befriended them. And I was like, they're like, do you read comics? I was like, no, but I always wanted to. Like, what do I start? And they're like, well, this is new. <laughs> so right. it was uh, Spider-Man Torment. And uh, that that's what sucked me into the the hobby. And I started like just collecting. I couldn't buy them fast enough for how fast I read them, right? But when you're a kid, you have a lot more free time too. So you sit down, you read 30 in one sitting, not a big deal, <laughs> right? Right. Yeah. It's not like, like nowadays where we all have like, you know, to be read piles just stacking up beside the bed or exactly. something. Exactly. <laughs> like if I read at the pace that I did when I was a young teen, I, there'd be no piles. Right. Like, 100%. Even faster than they're produced. Uh, oh, McFarland's uh, Spawn Spider Man. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Those things were insane. That's, that's webbing. You know, he made the, the, he, the like the webbing and webbing. like the poses. Yeah. Like, I think that was the first time they'd actually tried to make Spider-Man look like a spider with the way he's like standing. Yeah. I think Todd took it to another level of like, let's introduce some more character to his artwork, you know, character yeah. beyond the story of what we've told you. Let's show you a new side of Spider-Man, like a new way to visually tell his story. And I thought he did a great job that way. 
Um, but no, back to the question. So yeah, that's what got me into comic books. What got me into the comic book industry, I say if I didn't get into the creative industry to begin with, like in the video game industry, I probably wouldn't have even tried for the comic book industry. Mm-hmm. Since uh I got into video games, I realized that, you know, and say it's possible to have like a a creative um a creative job that you'll like that you enjoy. Like I didn't think video games was a real job that people did, you know. Right. Something other people did. Like there's professionals out there hiding in the shadows, putting things out. Yeah, you think it's like this weird, like secret cabal off yeah, like, exactly. one office somewhere that makes all the video games. Like <laughs> it's it's like acting, like movies. It's like I can't be an actor. That's that's another group you of get people. plucked I'm from birth in, to do that, I'm right? Like, like, yeah. <laughs> so uh, but when I got that, that's when it became possible. And um, and I'll tell you, this is gonna be a, a little short bit. I actually got into art, like I was always an artist. Mm-hmm. But I got into art school um, by accident. I uh, didn't know that doing art for a living was um, a job. You know, all I knew was the term "starving artist," and I was like, "That sounds like a that sounds like a crap job." <laughs> right. I, I don't want to be starving. That's a crappy title. And uh, so, out of high school, the guidance counselor told me, "Oh, apply to broadcasting." So I did. All all reject rejected everywhere. Didn't get so no broadcasting for me. So I was like, I don't know what to do. And then I got a call from a college in Toronto, and uh, which that's where, I, where I'm from. And they were like, uh, there was a mail strike at the time. They called me, and they were like, Yeah, you can pick up your um, your timetable, your courses, all your curriculum. You can pick it up on Monday at this time at the front office. I was like, Whoa, 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 whoa. Am I accepted into? college <laughs> and they're like yeah. oh yeah so you didn't know yeah they loved your portfolio they wanted you to come in but i was like okay great um sorry not to hold you what what college and like centennial okay great great what so wait, program? they never like notified you that you were getting accepted no. to anything well here's the thing i was like what program and they're like oh it's the uh i think it was called illustration technical or something i can't remember what it was called uh or art no it wasn't that was some that was another course but anyways they gave me the art course name and i was like Okay, so I got accepted and I can come pick that up on Monday and then I'm in. And they're like, yep, okay. Be there Monday, hung up. First thing, I was like, how the hell did I get accepted to art college? I never even applied to any art courses. I None. I never applied to a single art course. All I applied to was broadcasting. That was all I applied to what? because I didn't know what the hell I was doing. So there was some paperwork mishap, and I don't have a. So you I didn't, didn't have a send, portfolio. like I was going to say you didn't send him a portfolio no, or anything. I didn't like, have a portfolio. So I was going to say, well, like, I mean, I guess portfolio. like especially back then, what kind of portfolio do you really have for like especially broadcasting? Like, yeah. So it was I didn't have it. Like I was just a dumb high school student, and they accepted me into this college, so I just went. I just showed up on Monday and went, and it nobody never, ever questioned it. No, <laughs> no, never. Nobody ever questioned it. So that's what got me into the creative uh, industry was this random wow. call. and I got accepted into a course I never applied to. So that is fascinating. <laughs> yeah, there's probably some other Mark Maya out there somewhere who just didn't get a shot. <laughs> you know oh I mean? my god! <laughs> uh, now you got to look over your shoulder at every convention, like <laughs> yeah. So then, you know, from there I got into, uh, animations and illustrations and, uh, not much so much in the writing, but I was always liked writing. Even as a kid, I wrote in school, I won writing competitions, you know, in grade school and in uh, high school, but, um, never thought again, never thought that was a job. So I thought I'll do comic books, but my sequential art was, eh. (laughs) my sequential art was very good. I'm more of a one, one piece type of thing. I can probably put out a cover, which I really nice at print, (laughs) but, uh, as far as like sequential art, it's not my, it's not my forte. Uh, like storyboarding was never really my thing. Um, so I found an artist, uh, making this long story short here at the end here. I I found my artist. Dude, if people don't talk, we don't have a show. So please (laughs) please answer your other questions. And I, you, it's possible you can ask these, but like I, when I first got into as writer because i decided i'm just gonna get into comic books as a writer i don't even know how to do that so i'm just gonna write my script i'm just gonna write a script i was like bottom line i know i need a script so that's what i'm doing i was like i don't know who the artist is i don't even know how to get into comics do i apply to marvel do i apply to dc is that how it works i have right. no freaking idea so um i wrote my script um 
tried to get an, I knew a lot of friends that were artists being, you know, in, in the, um, in the video game industry, a lot of, I knew a lot of my friends were artists, try to get them to work with me and being like a partnership, like, Hey, we'll do this thing. And I was like, I'll, I'll sweeten the deal. I was like, I'll pay for all the costs of printing. And then when the book gets out, uh, say the first $5,000 it makes is yours. And then we'll split everything after that 50, 50. So like, how does that sound? So for some people that was great and they jumped on, but they never finished because their full time jobs were creating art. So then they didn't want to go home and do that again. So I get it. No hard feelings. Right. So they dropped off. Uh, that happened a few times. I got involved with a few other projects, a few other artists, even projects that artists started. Those fell off again because, again, the commitment to doing your own thing, it was – it's difficult. I had it. It was on, so I, I always did my part. I wrote my script. <laughs> I did that right. stuff. But then uh, the arts fell off. Even when it was a project that it was an art started, they fell off. So I put it, I put the script away for many years, and uh, brought it back up last year. The script for So Called Living, and I decided I'm just going to do an employee employer situation. I'm just going to find an artist, hire him outright on a contract to do my book. No 50 50 deals. I'm going to pay you upright, outright. The book makes nothing. You still get paid. Right. Right. And it's not in, it's, you know, it's not in writing, but like if the book does really well, I'll gladly give you a bonus. But if I'm not going to split as soon as the, the book starts making money, because if you don't want to take the risk, then you don't get the reward. Do you know what I mean? But oh, yeah. I didn't. In all fairness to Marco, I never gave him that opportunity because at that point I was already like, I'm just looking for an employer, an employee. I mean, I'm just looking for a guy that I can hire to do my artwork. Now, I love working with Marco. Don't get me wrong. Right. But um, like before I ever found him, I already made that decision in my mind. I was like, I'm just going to, the only way this is going to get done is if I control it all myself and pay people to make this happen. Mm -hmm. um, just because I'm not really in those circles of like uh, a bunch of comic book indie creators that get together and they have these little powwows and they create and it's great. I'm not in those you're circles. Still trying to get in there. Yeah. So I'm not in those circles. So I was like, I'm well, just maybe gonna, after I, today you will be. Maybe. Maybe. Past so, guests, come on, hook him up, man. <laughs> well, I, I found a group, uh, lesser known comics. Um, I uh, they they they're a great group of like indie creators, and they get together every other Thursday, and um, they they meet up and discuss about their projects, and they work. They do a lot of titles under the lesser known comics label uh i, was which say, is, I think i've heard of that before yeah. it's, it's familiar so i i don't do books under their label because my, my books already planned like the the idea is i do books one and two on a kickstarter that funds i can use that money to do books two and three and that funds i can use that to you know four and five right if there's to, anything extra it's like sweet yeah. a little bonus like yeah so um the idea is to uh to get to get up to eight issues Anyways, that was a long answer to your question. And I it love been, it though. I'm restraining myself. I'm a bit of a rambler. So I want to give you the opportunity. To, everybody you know, who tells me, I'm sorry if I ramble, I literally tell everybody like, please ramble. talk. If you don't talk, it makes the show so much more difficult to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, I, I just, I, I want, I want to be able to talk to you. You know, give you, give you a, a chance too. Cause I, I do have a chance. I do have the, uh, I guess the reputation of like taking over a conversation just because I don't shut up. No, so. you're good, man. So <laughs> uh, with McFarland, I know you said that was kind of like the first comic you got into, like yeah. when you first got into everything. Were there other characters that you ended up gravitating to more or like was there a particular writer that you really kind of not necessarily tried to craft yourself after, but like looked to for like examples and reference and influence? When, when I look at writers that I – that I enjoy their style. I don't know if I necessarily match their style or try, or try to match their style, but when I read their books, I, I feel like if I could work with somebody and write with somebody and continue series, I'd like to try to do it this way or like this guy. So like, I okay. like Brian Michael Bendis. I like Robert Kirkman, uh, Mark Miller. Um, so those are my, probably my top three that I can think of with top of my head. Um, so those like Mark Miller, anything he writes, I, I usually like, like I, I'd have to I, agree. <laughs> um, he's just great. And, um, same and goes like, for pretty much all those names. You just, yeah, mentioned. yeah, yeah. Like, you know, and Bendis, uh, he made me interested in the Avengers and, uh, right. 
because he made them feel more real. Because I found why I couldn't get into the Avengers when I got in when I was into comic when I finally got into comics, they were a little too for me pompous and self righteous and being like, "This is the right Always way to do everything." Right. Yes. And it's too. It's too much. It's too. I was like, no, and they have to. They feel the need to like let everybody know how loyal I am. I will never do this. Well, you're especially if you're like 13, 14, just yeah. getting into comics, like at that point, you don't need the, you know, Hulk Hogan character, take your vitamins, eat and say your prayers, you know, all that nonsense. <laughs> it's like, you want some real characters. Yeah. So I, I never got into it. Then I, then I read, uh, what was the story you did? It was like that break something. I can't remember what it was called. It was breakout. Uh, I think that was him. Anyways, it was an Avenger story that he did. And I, and the, I was like, hey, these, these are these are good, <laughs> right? And then then I started getting to the Avengers when it was I don't remember which order they came in, but uh, Bendis brought me to the Ultimate Universe. But I don't think he he didn't do the Avengers. He did Spider Man there. It was him and Bagley. Yeah, because that was my comic book introduction to Spider Man. I was a little bit too young for McFarlane when it first came out, yeah. but I was just old enough to really get into it when Ultimate came out. Yeah, Ultimate Spider Man. That's what it was for, man. It was great because it was like a retelling of this old story, and you can get on board new, brought a new audience in. It was fantastic, and the way they did the Avengers in that first run. Of the ultimate, um, ultimate, oh, yeah. the ultimate, it was called the ultimates. It was awesome. So uh, my favorite part, I still think about it. There's a part where it's like, uh, it's like Hulk is going on a rampage and then there's a crater and like banners coming out of the crater. He's just transformed into banner and cap is looking at him down the crater. He's like, are you all right, son? And it's like that corny captain America moment. Yeah. And he's like, yeah. Cap. And he reaches out to help cap just boots him in the head and knocks him out. <laughs> I love that. I love that. He's just like, yes. I was like, you guys don't have to be so perfect all the time. It drives me nuts. It's right. not that what they like, do is perfect. It's the fact that they oh, once in a while, like <laughs> they speak perfect. They speak perfect about themselves. It's like, you can't stop the Avengers. We are undefeated. It's like, oh, stop it. <laughs> right. Use some contractions. Stop it. <laughs> you know, give it a break. Bring it down to reality a bit. So I like when the characters start feeling a little more grounded and realize that they're not perfect and they're idiots just like the rest of us, but they're right. idiots with superpowers. I prefer that take on it. And I think that's why I was kind of gravitated towards Spider-Man. Spider-Man's like my favorite character. He's the same here because he's super serious when he needs to be, but he also has like that sense of levity and he makes mistakes and makes fun of himself. You know, like yeah. he's a and real dude. Go, and then when he goes through like hard times, you feel that with him. You're like, oh, the happy guy's sad, right? But it's oh yeah, you want to cry, read Spider-Man Blue. <laughs> I that away. I'm I'm currently going through my um uh, my collection and I'm using uh CLZ collect that. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 And I'm using that to scan all my comics. And I just did the, the last bin I did, which I'm not feeling. I have a lot of bins to go still. I think I'm 12 bins in, but had Spider-Man blue in it. Oh, that's such a sad one, man. Like, Oh my goodness. Great artwork on the cover. Amazing. The cover artwork was amazing. I don't remember the insides because that one's yeah. just like, <laughs> but the cover work was amazing. <laughs> all right. Sorry. Uh, let, let's no, you're you're good, <laughs> man. So, what made you finally decide like this is? I, I really want to make this comic happen. Like, I know you said you had tried to do well, stuff yeah. with other artists, and they kind of fell off. And then you found this one and decided, I'm just going to hire this guy. And so, I, what was that motivate? Like, what was it about this story well, that you really wanted to tell? So called living is um, when I wrote the story. I just always wanted to write a story where anything could happen in in this world. Like, I want to create a world of my own, and I wanted to have all these monsters, werewolves, vampires, zombies, and us normies. And I wanted us to all coexist and coexist like I coexist with you. Right. I, I know you're a vampire. I know you're a werewolf, but I we're still having this. But yeah, you yeah, have yeah, a, yeah. a werewolf podcast. That's fine. Like, like it's not weird. It's just... Yeah, it's, there's vampires, there's werewolves, like whatever. It's, they're just uh, a part of society. They're yeah. just part of a regular society, but they have to deal with their same rules, you know, like you know, silver bullets and werewolves and uh, vampires bite you, you turn to a vampire. Zombies are a nuisance. Uh, but since we've grown up, since this reality, it's not a story where it's like we live normally and then boom, these things happen. These guys were here. The idea is like, as far as time, as far as we can remember, they were always there. So we, our society grew up with them, right? And, you know, yeah, sure, there was there was wars and et cetera. But right now, they, we're in a society just like now. It's not a future. It's not an apocalypse. 
it's just our current society, how it is now, you know, you go to Starbucks, <laughs> your barista's a werewolf, whatever it is. Right. Um, but because of that, our, the way we react to these characters is different. So you won't necessarily run in fear of uh, a vampire uh, because you figure, oh, he's, he's it's, but you might be wary because like you see like a, you know, like a gangbanger coming down the street. You're like, you're not going to necessarily turn around and like, oh my God, it's that monster. But you might right. be like, yeah, he might, he might shoot me. Like, I don't know. Like, <laughs> but the vampire, like, maybe he'll eat me. Maybe he won't. Is he a good vampire? Is he a bad vampire? I don't know. Because like, it's, it's like seeing a dark, like right now, seeing a dark person in a, like, or a person in a dark alley, you know? Yeah. Are, are they a psycho? Are they going to kill you? <laughs> are they going to eat you? Right, thing? right, right. Or are they just a, a nice old granny just walking by? You don't know. It's that. So what I look at it is, is like, yeah, sometimes vampires in this world do bad things, but sometimes people in our world do bad things. So, uh, but there's like sources like vampires can go get blood at like, you know, grocery stores or a bar. They can go get blood. They're right. serving for them because they've always been around. But if they want it fresh from the tap, they're going to have to break some rules or get, you know, some consent that that's, it's that world. That's not what the story is about, but that's the kind of world we're living. I'm just kind of painting a picture. So I wanted this world where all this could exist. So I developed these characters. I developed, uh, first Jack, Jill, Nick, and Casper. Um, Jack's our main human. He's the guy on the cover running toward us in our blue, in the blue pants. Um, Nick is sitting on the corner of the fry box. Jill is the girl in the pink top right above her is Casper and hiding cowering in the back is Jack as well because he's a bit of a coward. So the two big guys on the right, those are our vampires and the girl is Jill. So the idea was that I created these characters, their bios, how they look, what their personalities were. And then I just dropped them in the sandbox and I watched what happened as I wrote, like, I didn't know it was going to happen, but I just put them in the situation like, okay, I need you to, uh, I need these guys that are going to go buy food. Uh, and there's going to be some spoilers, but you can read the first issue for free on, um, comic, global comics. Global comics. <laughs> so you can read it for free on global <laughs> comics. And, uh, but yeah, so I was like, they start their, they eat their food. Then Jill breaks up with them and then they come across vampires and, you know, stuff happens. And then Jack has got to adapt to he starts coming across problems right away of being a vampire so the, i just had that in my head like a rough outline and then i plot these characters in the situation put them in their roles and i was like okay now how does jack order food how does he react when jill breaks up with him how does jill break up with him based on her personality that i wrote when they come across vampires how do each of them react to these these two personalities so for me i don't know what's going to happen i put the rough points there but then the characters kind of write themselves. So I like to see it. It keeps in writing interesting for me as well. And I've used this example before. It's like, let's say we're going to film a movie and uh, two, we're, we're going to film the same movie in parallel. One stars Jim Carrey. The other one stars Denzel Washington. Now here's the plot points. Character gets out of bed, stubs his toe, has to run downstairs to somebody banging on the door and it's the uh old lady from next door complaining about their dog pooped in their yard that's those are the plot points right that we're going to hit for this scene now jim carrey would act would react to that toe stubbing very differently than denzel washington oh yeah and the way he acts to the person coming to his okay. door saying, your dog pooped on my lawn would be very different than jim carrey how he would act to, to that yeah right? yeah yeah so when I write my characters and I have their personalities, I'm like, okay, he's like a Jim Carrey or he's a Denzel Washington. Not that any of those actors are references for me. I'm just using that. Right. Just using this as an analogy. Yeah. So, um, that's how I do it. It's like, okay, he's in this situation. How does Jack react? And I, and then I do it that way. So I just try to plot out the main points. Like this person's going to die. This person's going to go home. You're going to stay in his apartment. You're like, you, this guy's going to go get a coffee. Uh, he's going to meet this girl. And how does the interaction? So happen? you don't really go into it with like a full plot outline. You just go into it with like major points that are going to happen in the issue more or less. Yes, exactly. And yeah, then yeah, just yeah. kind of fill in the gaps with whatever pops in your head. Yeah. It's just like, put them on this adventure and like, how Do you would find you that's with? easier than trying to plan out a whole story? It is for me. Cause it doesn't, stop my because i found when i get it when i get into a flow of writing characters talking back and forth back and forth back and forth i don't have to cross check 
where I want the story to go every, you know, every few lines. You know what I mean? I, I don't. I just need to know that uh, they're ordering food. They're going to come across vampires. So I was like, okay. F- I mean, in there between, she breaks up with them. So that's all. I, I want to be able to just write. And when I first write a script, it's just like eighty pages nonstop of whatever. Just like just all of the thoughts that are coming. Like, to your dialogue, head, dialogue, right? dialogue. And I'll put like you know, tab. I have an idea for a panel. He should be doing something like this. Dialogue, 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 dialogue. And then um, I don't even write who's saying the dialogue. I don't want to slow myself down because once I figure out, oh, it's Jack and Jill and Jack and Jill and Jack and Jill. And if I introduce a new character, I might put Casper. <laughs> like <laughs> he's now talking. So how do you decide to like what cut out of that? Like, cause I imagine when you get done and you've got this like pile of paper in front of you, it's got to look like a mess it's, at first. Like, uh, Well, first I, then I read it back to me and I just try to tighten it up because a lot of, a lot of it, I, I end up keeping actually, I just might say it in a different way. Um, because, because I do have those anchor points, mm-hmm. I kind of got an idea of how, like how long is it going to take to get there? And if I get in, if something inspires me and I'm like, Holy, their, their trip across the street is like, Oh, it's going to get crazy. It's going to be like an adventure from, the, from one end to the other. And then maybe I'll do that. Oh, maybe this is just an issue on its own of them crossing the street because, you know, hilarity ensues. They can't cross for whatever reason. And it's like a whole adventure and it's just blown out of proportion. Again, never happened. Just, just an example. <laughs> but uh, that that's just how I write. Oh, is this about Bendis' Daredevil? Huh. Uh, which which uh, Daredevil did he do? Because I remember Underboss, that was... That wasn't Bendis, was it? Who wrote Underboss? I don't think that was Bendis. But Underboss was, that's probably my favorite uh, Daredevil story. That was dark. That, that was really good. <laughs> dark. That was, that was a good one. I was going to say, um, speaking of dark, the comedies in the comedy in this book is dark to the point where it's like, you know, really, 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 really super like squeamish people will be like, ew, that's not funny. How do you think that's funny? But like, you know, the adult it, swim crowd <laughs> we're like this is awesome like, <laughs> so you read it yeah oh yeah well, excellent like you know don't be surprised because i i've done a few you know uh like podcasts and interviews to um to promote the book you know you go on the tour and you meet new people which is great um and very few have actually read the book <laughs> that's unfortunate like i don't I mean, I'm not judging anybody, but like, I don't understand how you can do a podcast and not read the book of the person coming onto the podcast like that. But, uh, but it's, but I'm, I, I'm flattered that somebody did, uh, like whenever anybody does read it. So thank you. Thank you. For I was going to say no hundred percent because like, I want to give away what happens at the end of issue one so bad because the way it ends is just so like matter of fact. <laughs> so and so you get you get the humor which is good <laughs> yeah yeah it's just like yeah okay but it's like dude that was just okay like, <laughs> yeah, you, you, you just kind of roll event. with it yeah exactly he just rolls the punches like all right and um i think i i've like compared i think in the kickstarter page there's something that says something like um, it's like a, a friends type of cast as they start, I start introducing more people, but it it's gives not, that vibe a little bit, but like, yeah, just much darker. Like, yeah, and I, <laughs> I start seeing his friends, then you'll start seeing like the way they know their way they're comfortable with each other and they're sarcastic and they mock each other, but they're always good with each other. They'll help, you know, they help each other through the toughest times, but they're a bunch of tools just kind of like, right. It, like they're really close, but they're like, oh, you they're got, how do you, get, how do you guys together all like, the time? Like, yeah. <laughs> So those are and the then, best friends. I feel like, like if you can sit there and insult each other and then be just fine, like, <laughs> yeah, and that's, and that's how they are. And, um, and then also have like, uh, I described as Sopranos tension because there's some bad guys that get involved and you start mm-hmm. seeing them get involved in book two. And, um, he, Jack is going to get in over his head. So he's like this, He's a bit of a bumbling idiot, and he gives um, that vibe. He gives that vibe. <laughs> I kind of sympathize with yeah. him a little bit. So the people that he's getting going to get involved with, they are not bumbling idiots. They are very. They have a very ser- sorry. They have a very serious tone to them, which is opposite of Jack. So imagine like, Jack is just like, I just want to chill. Like yeah. I don't want so, no problems. Yeah. So imagine like you know 
Chandler and Joey from Friends getting involved with like the Sopranos. That's oh you know what I mean. <laughs> it's like uh like how do so they're dealing with it and staying in character, but they're in a very serious situation. <laughs> right. <laughs> so and so that's kind of how um Oh, somebody wrote, why did somebody wrote on, this was interesting. I mentioned this at the beginning, the fact that restream allows me to share on my channel and somebody came through on my channels on boarding coffee saying, why does he hate poutine? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, here's okay. Now, oh, here it is. Yeah. Oh, you saw it. You saw it come through. Yeah. So I thought this now I was going to upset some people, but I don't like poutine. <laughs> Because I don't like cheese. I like cheese on pizza, but that's pretty much it. I've tried cheese, but I don't, it does. I don't like Not it. Like just and to I, take it out the fridge, open up a slice and eat it sitting no, on the couch. I'm going to lose my, my Canadian card because I don't like <laughs> So, um, I'll say maybe that is an American thing. I don't know. <laughs> no, like, uh, the, we, know, there's a lot of things we do that apparently nobody else does. So <laughs> Canadians love their poutine. So, um, but yeah, so that's a lot of things Jack does. It's because that's a little bit of me in him. And here's a little fun fact. Jack was originally Mark. I named him after me, but I couldn't write the script for me. Like once it I just thought, felt weird doing once it. Once that was my me in there, I was like, I can't do this. I don't know what to do. And uh, somebody told me, change his name. Just change his name. And I was like, really? And then they're like, yeah, I read somewhere that if you just change their name, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, okay, well, I'll, I'll give it a go. I, I think it's bullshit, but I'll give it a go. So I was watching 24 at the time. So I changed it to Jack from Jack Bauer from 24 yeah. and it stuck in my head. I was like, I'll turn it to, I'll change it to Mark later, but I'm not going to it's, I still can't because if I, if I have that thought in my head, then I, I'm still writing for me. Like I can't, I can't deep myself out that much. So, <laughs> so it kind of flipped a switch where you're yeah. like, okay, this is no longer me. Yeah. This so is I Jack can now. Write for somebody who doesn't exist. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's it's Jack now. So then it became Jack and Jill. Uh, so I mean, that's, that's just natural, right? Yeah. So I felt because originally it was Mark and Jill. <laughs> Jack and Jill just fits so much better. It does. Though. It fits. It fits so well. And it because I, you almost start expecting a Jack and Jill story at one point because they do kind of go up a hill. They do. At one they point, do and it, <laughs> it's just only one of them comes back and, down the hill. You know, <laughs> and, and that that hill thing about that hill is. When I originally wrote it, it was just supposed to be like a little grassy knoll beside oh. a parking lot that they kind of went over. And uh, when Marco drew it, he drew this big hill and she was running up the hill. And I was like, hey, that kind of works. Jack and Jill went up the hill. Right. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, okay. That, I'm done. I was like, and uh, I was like, not, not what I described, but that's better. I like yours better. So, um, and then as I was writing, that whole, as you read the book or Nick discovers their names are, you know, he puts together their names are Jack and Jill. And that's when, that's only when it clued into me when I was writing the script, I was like, wait a second, you guys are Jack and Jill. That's in my head. I was like, oh yeah, they are. They're Jack and Jill. It's just something you started doing. Didn't even really think about yeah, it. I didn't even realize it because his name was, and it's not like in my head, I'm saying Jack and Jill all the time. So right. when I write, when I write my scripts, I'm going through, you know, like I said, I don't even write their name. So I'm like, you know, uh, line one, line two, line one, line two, line one, line two, like boom, 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 boom. They're just responses. Like, and uh, so I'm not even writing their names. And when I st went through and started cleaning it up and they met Nick and these, that's when it clued into me. So I just inclu included that in the script. Yeah. And there's some pages from uh, book two. I would say we, we got a l couple little teasers that you said we could show. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, lo yeah. I love these variant covers too. Oh, thank you. The, uh, well, then the one on the right is not the variant. That's the, uh, that's the original cover for yeah. number two, right? Number two. Yeah. The variant on the left is from, uh, Ashton Techno Prasad. He's a photographer in Toronto and, uh, he's great. You can follow him on Instagram. I think Ashton Techno is what he goes by on Instagram. It's okay. fantastic. Phenomenal photographer. And I've known him since he was 10 years old. Um, oh, he was, wow. He was a child. I was an adult, but I knew him since he was 10 because he's um, my best man's stepson. Ah, so, okay. I got you. And they grew up and, you know, you, you see kids and they grow up and you're like, yeah, you're just gonna, you always see them as kind of like that little kid until they show you something. Like he showed me his photography the first time before he like blew up. And now people are like flying him to Paris. He's flying to Paris and New York. Oh, to that's take awesome. Photography. But before that, when he first saw his work, I was like, holy crap, you did this? 
Because you're still was, seeing like the little yeah. 10 year old kid and that was, you met back in the day. Yeah. And then I was like, you're, it's, I was like, this stuff's amazing. Like your, your photography is amazing. That's not even like the stuff, I, the, the image that uh, he let me use for the cover is not my favorite of his. He's got so many, so, so many good photos, but I wanted to put something of his on there because I thought it, 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 I guess it, it made it feel personal that it was somebody I knew had their art mm -hmm. on my comic. Um, and the fact that it was a shot of Toronto and that's, you know, where I was born and raised, I feel like, you know, like shout out to my hometown. It was just a very so, personal cover. For yeah. Me. Yeah. So I wanted to use that. And the, the other variant for that is the one that you, him running, um, you showed earlier the purple cover with Jack running. That's the, yeah, that's the variant for uh, book one on the left. And that's uh, Derek Lofman, who's um, a good friend of mine. I've known him for years. We worked together in the video game industry and uh, he lives, he lives in, London, Ontario with me. And, uh, he put together this cover for me and I think it's great. He did a great cover. No, did awesome. a great job. That, yeah. I was going to say the art style, like period in this book is so good because it's so like, it feels like something that would be on adult swim. Mm. Yeah, if Mar it, like ever got optioned for it. Like the, uh, if adult swim, Hey, pick yeah. this up. <laughs> Marco. Uh, yeah. Marco nailed it. And the thing is when I was looking for artists, I had a specific, uh yes <laughs> that's my wife <laughs> she, she's, she, Mrs. Maya. she joined in the she's joined in the chat um but uh I, i'm guessing the toddler is eating is that's why she's able to join in the chat <laughs> so <laughs> i got a buddy going through a newborn right now so yeah, hey <laughs> yeah, we have our toddler somebody's always uh always watching out but um what, what was I talking about? I can't remember what I was talking about. I lost it. Oh yeah. Marco, the art yeah, style. Yeah. So I had a specific art style in mind and I like Ramos. Uh, I like Ramos's art style. So I was looking for somebody that kind of draws like Ramos. And uh, a lot of people have compared this also to like chew. It does kind of give off that vibe for <laughs> sure, vibe? but it's not like so similar no. that it feels like it's copying no, yeah, or it's something not. like. Chew's got a little bit more, it has a little bit more uh, cartooniness this we guessed like, right deformation of the characters on on it so it's not the same style at all but i can see where people can draw comparisons and uh but then when i found marco and i was like oh his art is so close to ramos but i just need you to adult it up a bit because his specialty is he, he does really thing where he does a really good job at like characters that look like kids and they're super detailed and they have all this curly hair and that's right, right. Sort of like what kind of uh, Scotty Young's been doing with his variant covers, where yeah, but, they're like the, but, the little baby versions of the characters. He's less, he does, his are less chibi and they look like skinny nine year olds. Okay. Right. I can, so, okay, I can picture what you're saying. And, uh, and yes, Ramos is top notch. He's one of my favorite artists. I actually reached out to, uh, shout out Michael out Balonis, Ramos. the is, uh, former guest of the show. Oh. Welcome, Michael. Yeah. yeah uh, <laughs> Ramos actually wrote, a, I, I reached out to him on socials to be like, maybe I can get him to do a cover. <laughs> like, let's see. And no response. Ramos, well, if, you're, if you're watching, uh, I'd love you to do a cover. <laughs> I was going to say, you, you know you want to do a cover for this book. I mean, look at and, this. And like that, uh, when I saw that report, a news reporter on the TV, I was like, oh, that's so Ramos. <laughs> like right like, like, like and that that's part of what you were talking about where the world is just like all these people and all these creatures just kind of are like yeah. there's a news story about a zombie like riot going on and these two are just like nah they got gravy on my fries and i asked for no gravy like yeah <laughs> and that's that's how i wanted to introduce the world is because you know and because jack's reactions off panel off screen is like oh my god can you believe this is happening like that's what the the dialogue is and then you've right. talking about a surprise and jill's watching tv and she looks so uninterested like yeah just another day and then you know the next page is like the zombie uh the, you know this i can't remember what oh i'm drawing a blank I can't remember what i call it <laughs> the, the the zombie cleanup crew you know they just came yeah. come in here with their vans and they wrapped up the zombies and the, the problem was like cleaned right up it's they're kind of like you find a you get a, a raccoon under your deck and you call, you know, the animal control. Right. Like, these guys <laughs> zombie are zombie control. Like, you're like, oh, there's a zombie in my deck, under my deck or in my pool. Like, can you come get these guys? Can you come get this out? <laughs> <laughs> I love it, though, because it's like it's funny without like trying too hard to be funny. Like, it just is funny. Thank if you. that makes any sense. Like, 
there's these little subtle jokes I have in there that I've built into the world. That's just a, it's the rule of the world. I think people will pick up as the book goes where um, it's like the second or third last page in book one, where uh, since you've read it, there's that line where Jack's like, well, there's a pool yeah, and then yeah. it, it, it pants to the pool and the zombie is like, you know, in the, there's a zombie in the water up to here. And, you know, Nick's line is like, yeah, a regular lap of luxury or something he says, right? right. So like, but it's just the zombie, there. Yeah, the zombie in the pool is kind of this ongoing joke or part of the reality where zombies are attracted to pools. Like how you always end up with leaves in your pools. It's like they're magnetized to leaves in your pool. Zombies will end up in your pool. So there'll be guys with like, you know, nets trying to get zombies, z- nets and hooks trying to get the zombies to their pool. So it's just a common thing. Oh, what is it? What I hate when I get off work at 6 30. I'm just reading, reading the comment. We're just always happy that you uh, show up, Michael. We love the fact that you still hang out with us. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's, that's like an, un, like an, a subtle thing. I, I don't bring really attention to it. It's just like they mentioned the pool and you cut to the pool and there's a zombie in it, yeah. but they don't even address the zombie. It's just no. a thing. It's so, just existing by itself there. And there's uh well, like there's one joke. This, this it's just a small joke. Doesn't really spoil anything. But somebody is going to be talking about their apartment, and they're going to be like, "And there's a pool," and it's going to cut to the pool, and it's just like overrun with zombies, like just in the, and it cuts back to Jack, and he's like, "There's always a pool." <laughs> <laughs> It's it's like there's a feature, you know, it's like a feature. Like, like he hey, notices the joke, yeah. just never acknowledges it until yeah. that one little moment. I love so, that kind of stuff because it's almost like a fourth wall break, but not really. So it's the the world does like expand and there's more characters that get involved. And the first two issues are very much setting up Jack and the main crew and introduces, you know, our bad guys in book two. And then once book three and four kicks up then that's kind of like where the the danger happens right that's right when like because uh jack's situation (laughs) of like becoming a vampire is going to intersect (laughs) with these other events of very serious people and uh the and soprano like characters yeah. you were talking so, about it's going to intersect with them and he's he's not going to be prepared um so she, yeah it, he doesn't strike me as the prepared for anything kind of guy no and did you <laughs> notice the, the bunny motif there's like a well there's a bun, bunny motif on the kickstarter page but there's a like slight little bunny me- mentions in the book okay that that's a thing that shows up later as far as like it comes up again, but it comes up as people talking it like, like they describe in the first book in the news as the bunny crisis. Yes. Right? Okay. I was, okay. I was trying to like, remember which part of issue one yeah, did they mention like, bunnies? Cause I know I remember two, seeing it. It's page two or three. They're like, cause they're talking about the zombies and it was quickly, you know, Oh, quickly handled by the zombie control team. And then, and then it was go, like just a background story going on while they were talking. Exactly. About the yeah. bunny crisis. And, uh, and then that's it. And then there's no mention of it again. And then, you know, book two, there's a little bit more and book three is a little bit more. And, <laughs> but the way they talk about it as well, it's almost like, yeah, it's an issue happening somewhere else. else. Like, uh, like it's, it's, yeah, it's raining, but it's not raining here. <laughs> you know what right. I mean? <laughs> so they, they just talk about it like, eh. <laughs> and the, so, and they kind of take, Jack kind of never takes anything too seriously you know until it's he's kind of like me in that way where i take nothing too seriously until it affects me then i'm like oh i'm screwed now i'm screwed right right now it's time to once you realize you're already like out of options (laughs) too late to take it seriously that's when you take it seriously of course (laughs) so that's how that's how jack rolls no i love it so you said this is going for what you're playing on eight issues yeah, eight issues. Uh, that should wrap up the story. And uh, I'd like to revisit So Called Living, and uh, probably as another. I'd like to do it as a kind of a, a series, a mini series. You know, just like eight issues, and then eight issues, or something, like, something like yeah. that. Where it just like you like, can like revisit. like a season of a show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'd like to do it like that. And obviously, if I could write more, it'd be great. Um, but it depends how the the Kickstarters do, right? Um, right now, I've 
unless there's a mass exodus on Kickstarter, everything's going well. <laughs> so, um, I, I, I don't see that going away anytime soon. No, so I, uh, I think I might, I might have. S- I might have to bite the bullet on shipping a little more than I thought because of the way things are going in Canada as far as our weird tax, unnecessary taxes. I, say, that are I keep happening. seeing all kinds of stuff on my TikTok feed, and I'm like, I'm in Columbus, Ohio. Why are you guys showing me stuff from Canada that I don't understand what's going on? Like, it's, it's, it's a mess here. It's a mess. That's what um, it looks like, man. Because now I'm starting to watch the videos because they just pop up so much. Yeah, because like we we have our uh, shipping costs and uh, up on like on our page and in this like in the states and we're we're actually we lowballed compared to like a lot of other like I try to back a book from the states to here an indie book and it cost it was a ten dollar book twenty three dollars shipping from the states to here and I was like holy yeah. crap so I was like I know shipping Canada just sucks in general. Um, so shipping to and shipping out of and shipping within anything Canada is involved, our shipping is just crazy expensive. What you guys ship for like $10 costs us 60. It's crazy. Is it because you guys are just so much bigger? Like they've got more distance to travel or what? No, I, I don't know. I'm guessing there's, there's a little bit of greed involved. I don't know. what it I'm is. assuming that's usually what the problem is. Nine but, times uh, out of 10. but yeah, the, like our shipping for the States is like 12 bucks Canadian, which is like eight dollars or something like that mm-hmm. us uh and that's anywhere in the states and that really when we did the cost that covers us to the um the upper side but the, when you go south <laughs> we start eating eating the cost on that but we're like okay let's just we just want to get our books into people's right. hands right so it's like ten dollars all across canada and twelve dollars all across the states even though those costs aren't accurate <laughs> as far as like our accurate cost like that's what we're charging for sure, right. that's accurate that but way. But it's not necessarily what it always costs. Yeah. So, but we're like, yeah, we'll eat the cost just because we want people to get the book, and we want to make it, you know, as easy as possible for people to get the book. Um, but the other day, my uh, wife shipped something, and she used the shipping service that we use, and she was like, "Yeah, it costs this much." And I was like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, whoa!" <laughs> it's like this, and she used my like the packaging. We bought the packaging for the comic book, so I was like, "This might as well be." Uh, backer level like and that those numbers don't add up with what we came up with like what three weeks ago and right like, yeah because i think it's because the the stupid carbon tax has driven everything up now i did mention that in the text it's it, it says estimated cost like it might change things out of our control but if we can still keep it we're gonna keep it like I, my goal is still right now keep it as is because like i'll and I'll adjust for the next Kickstarter. Right. Because I'm I'm very much a man of my word. So if I say something. Don't like changing something I after you've already put it up or. Yeah. So I don't like changing. Uh, like I, if I tell you I'm going to do something, I do not like changing. And if I do, I just hate myself for it. And I, I'd feel worse about changing it than I would about paying it, paying the difference. Right. So and that's it. No, I get that 100%. Like I would rather just. Yeah, it's easier to just do what you said you're going to do (laughs) rather than like try to send out a bunch of, oh, we apologize, but now we have to do this and now we have to do that. And it's, yeah, just it's easier just to eat a couple bucks. (laughs) Yep. Yep. It's true. All right. What's what's next? uh, Is there any other genres that you would want to explore other than like the dark comedy side of things? Like there are there other stories you've got like ready to go on the back burner? There are. There's one that I started. I wrote issue one and I really enjoyed it. And then I I started doing those rough plot points. Uh, But I've only established one character um, so far. And it's so far. It's only got a project title which okay. I, I apply project titles to things if I don't want until I have an actual title, which is, I guess a habit I get from the video game industry. You know, it's like project right. X, project black chair. <laughs> you right. know I mean? Everything's got to be a secret. And- so, um, but I didn't have a title for this. So right now it's called like the Japan story. Uh, and the reason it's called the Japan story is because Japan plays a big part in this story, but it doesn't take place in Japan. <clears throat> it's just a way to keep track of what you were thinking about. Yeah, that so day, I was like, okay, I got it. So I wrote the first issue, and I really like the way that's working out. But that issue is very much not 
sarcastic dark humor it's it's like a, a very serious um sci-fi angle so it's a very it's it's present day mixes with sci-fi and it's got a very serious tone to it so it's very much like reading um like the when, when you read a serious sci-fi novel right okay. but at, but at the pace of a comic book so okay it's kind of so it's very different tone and for that i wouldn't have marco illustrate i would have to i would need somebody that um draws things a little less animated if that makes sense a little, a little grittier a little rigid a little more rigid to their people because something that looks more like um a drawing of a real person not not to look real but you know like how our bodies move versus how a cartoons move like right. that's which is how like so-called living is illustrated more like like, like when uh jack's running and his arms are like super all crazy yeah, exactly. like you know nobody runs like that <laughs> no. or like there's a part where he's hanging upside down he's like he's right which it works for that art style 100 yeah. percent. but so that wouldn't be the situation for this so uh i'd find somebody that has a more serious style uh, but that would be that story if it goes as planned would be a one and done Okay. So it would be like a short mini series and then that story, that world will be resolved. Kind of like the, the amount for a good graphic novel. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because the way I'm seeing it, it's, it's one of those like world global changing events. So mm -hmm. after that event is resolved, be it good or bad, it, the world's changed forever. So you, can, you won't be able to continue that story. Gotcha. Um, so that it's it's going to be a one and done leave it um, there's not a lot of those anymore like everything's got a spin off or you know like there's always like an alternate timeline or i, I feel yeah. like sometimes you don't need to be over complicated with that kind of stuff like well we're, stories we're, can have a true beginning middle and end sometimes like well, we were talking about like uh harrow county right mm -hmm. uh that's a story that's got it ends it just ends and it's a great story Great and it doesn't need to be anything more than what it is. No, it's it's uh, Harrow Harrow County. If you haven't read it, go out there, check it out. It's awesome. It's a horror. It's definitely a horror comic. Oh yeah, for sure. I wouldn't <laughs> yeah. recommend that for all ages by any yeah. means. But... Not, not, for the kiddies. not for the kiddies. <laughs> uh, it's like when you walk around with a skin sack in your purse that talks to you. Yeah, <laughs> it's out there. It's out there. If you want a unique story, check out Harrow County. Oh, yeah. It's for definitely sure. different, but great. Well, if they want to check out your stuff, where can they find you online? Where can they find So Called Living? Tell everybody how they can get a hold of you. Well, So Called Living is up on Kickstarter until um, April 25th, and it's for books one and two. So that will come as a set. If you want to get a taste of it, uh, book one is available for free. Like you can read it for free on global comics. And if you, if you go to Kickstarter page, you can read the first five pages. And then there's a link at the bottom that takes you right to global comics. So you could read that for free. And, um, and then if you like it, I was kind of putting my work on the line being like, I th this is a good story. These are good characters. You're going to like it. So I want to show you, I'm giving you basically half the story for free of, from this Kickstarter. Like at least the Kickstarter portion of it, half of it for free. So you can back me so I can do the rest of the stories. And, you know, book one will be stay up for free forever. Um, but everything else, ideally, you know, Kickstarter will come through. So, yeah, find uh, So Called Living on Kickstarter. Uh, I'm, um, you can also, you know, reach out to us on Instagram and Facebook. Although those channels haven't had much action on it yet because I started them the same time I did the Kickstarter. So it's a, it's a lot of plates. <laughs> Trust spin. me, I know that game 100%. So, I do this all day, every day. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the multi-platform thing can get exhausting. Yeah. And another way to reach out to me is just uh, Board Game Coffee, which is our YouTube channel. And um, we got our Instagram channel, our YouTube channel, and our Facebook. So just look at Board Game Coffee and uh, you'll find us. And uh, that's that's pretty much it. So-called Living and Board Game Coffee on all social media and you'll, you'll find us. So-called Living written, how it is there. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll throw that QR code back up on the screen. You guys can scan that code right there, or we do have links down in the description to the Kickstarter, also to Mark's website for So Called Living, so you can find out more about the book there as well. 
Um, if you guys want to help and support the show to help us support the independent comic book community, get more people on here and go more places to do the show live, uh, you can go over to our Indie Inkwell merch store and pick up a t-shirt or a hoodie or a sticker, or you can just hit the like and subscribe button. That really helps us out a lot more than you would think. Um, is there anything else you want to plug before I let you go enjoy the rest of your evening, man? No, no, that's, that, that's it. Just, you know, back so-called living. Cause it's, uh, backing now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Shout you. out Michael Balonis, man. Thank you, Michael. Everybody go check out his book as well. Uh, Wendy and the other side, really good all ages book. Check that out too. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem, man. And as always, everybody out there, please be safe, be kind and take it easy. We will see you back next week. Take it easy guys. See ya.